I'm looking at I'm looking at this. I'm like, okay, I can't go back any farther.
Good afternoon and welcome to the 19th Annual Distinguished Explorer Award Celebration. My name is Steve Vavris. I'm president of the Roy Chapman Andrews Society, whose mission is to inspire scientific discovery by engaging with contemporary explorers who exemplify the legacy of Roy Chapman Andrews, Beloit's native son. This DEA event is being hosted as a partnership with the Beloit Public Library. So I want to thank Nick DeMassis, Library Director and Society Board Member in back, and his entire staff for making this event possible. So thank you all. So not only is today special after a three-year hiatus for in-person events for our society, but we're also celebrating a couple of firsts. This year marks the 100th anniversary of Andrew's first Central Asiatic expedition to the Gobi Desert, which made him an international celebrity when his team discovered the first nests of, di of fossilized dinosaur eggs. And this year, we've created a brand new visual history exhibit of Andrew's life that you just passed through on the way in. From his childhood years in Beloit, to his ongoing legacy through the Distinguished Explorer Award, which honors internationally renowned scientists. The exhibit also features a display case located over there of artifacts from Andrew's granddaughter, Sarah Appleby, who generously donated these from her personal collection. So we welcome you to take a look at those afterwards. Now there isn't enough time today to thank everybody who made this event possible but I do want to recognize a few people in particular. First, we're most grateful to our award recipient, Professor Philip Curry in the front for making the long trip from Edmonton to Beloit and sharing his experiences with us today. Dr. Curry also presented a virtual lecture on Monday afternoon to students in various uh, area schools which are represented here today, these being the school districts of Beloit Beloit Turner, Clinton, South Beloit, and Lincoln Academy. So thank you all for attending today and on Monday. Second, as you can imagine, an event like this requires a lot of planning. The work of the Roy Chapman Andrews Society is accomplished through our volunteer board of directors and our tireless quarterback and administrative assistant, Ruth Carlson. Thank you, Ruth. And Ruth somehow manages to make sure that every duck is in its proper row, so we're grateful to her for that. And at this time, I'd like to thank all of them, Ruth and the entire board members, by please standing up and being recognized for your hard work. And third, despite the hard work of this team, we couldn't function as an as a organization without the financial support of the, our society's backers. We're a membership-driven organization, so we rely on the generosity of our members and our sponsors. And you can see before you this list of impressive uh, sponsorship, the donors uh, for this event who made this uh, day possible. And I'd like to just acknowledge a few of those in particular, some of the largest benefactors for today. First, the Wisconsin Humanities. They were the ones who gave us the large grant that allowed the visual history exhibit to take place, and that was then supplemented by support from other generous donors. Stateline Community Foundation, the Nice Family Foundation, ABC Supply, Angus Young, and Visit Beloit. So please let's give a hand to all of our sponsors. And now we will hear a very special and unique welcome from Sarah Appleby, Andrew's granddaughter, who put together this introductory video from her home in Texas for the unveiling of the exhibit and for today's event. Hello, my name is Sarah Appleby. Roy Chapman Andrews was my grandfather. I am so pleased to be joining you in celebration of the 19th Distinguished Explorer Award. This event honors 
today's modern day explorers who exemplify my grandfather's legacy. My congratulations to Dr. Philip Curry, this year's recipient. From what I understand, his interest in dinosaurs and exploring began at a very early age, just like Roy, always looking around the corner for something new to explore. This year also marks the 100th anniversary of my grandfather's first of five Central Asiatic expeditions, where the remarkable discovery of the first dinosaur eggs took place. A special exhibit entitled The Visual History of Roy Chapman Andrews, Beloit's Native Son, opens today. It showcases the life and adventures of my grandfather. I can speak for him in saying he would be very honored because Beloit and the Roy Chapman Andrews Society has kept my grandfather's legacy alive is the reason I decided to donate his memorabilia, books, and photographs to his hometown. After all, Beloit is where he began his adventures. On a personal note, Roy was a wonderful grandfather, just as special and charismatic as you have no doubt heard, even to a nine-year-old. I don't believe I really knew how famous he was at the time, but I just knew no one else's grandfather had a really cool sword or a dinosaur egg on their coffee table. It is my pleasure to share him with you. Thank you. Since its inception in 1999, the Roy Chapman Andrews Society has maintained a close partnership with Beloit College, with whom we share a common goal of promoting education. Although COVID concerns precluded having this event at our usual college venue, we're pleased that they could continue their support and participation today. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Kristen Bonney, Assist Associate Dean at Beloit College, who will give a welcome message on behalf of campus. everyone. On behalf of Beloit College, I am pleased to welcome you to the 100th anniversary tribute to Roy Chapman Andrews, a Beloiter whose powerful intellect and scientific contributions continue to inform and inspire those in our community and around the world. The city of Beloit and Beloit College share a common pride in Roy Chapman Andrews, and this event brings together the people of Beloit to celebrate one of our own, and to show off our community's adventurous and entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirits that embraces challenge and opportunity time and again. At Beloit College, we empower our students to lead fulfilling lives marked by high achievement and purposeful consequence in whatever form and down whichever path those take them. Whether it be an English major that graduated in 1906 who became the claimed inspiration for Indiana Jones, or as a biochemistry and dance double major who graduated 100 years later to go on to be a family practice physician serving a rural community in Oregon. Together, the city and the college help inspire the curiosity and creativity, grit and professional agility of the Roy Chapman Andrews and thousands of Blake College alumni. As I learned more about this year's Distinguished Explorer awardee, Dr. Philip Curry, it became clear that his life and his career has also been very Beloitish. Through his teaching and mentoring, Dr. Curry shares the excitement of discovery with the next generation of scientists, whether students in his classroom or the volunteer citizen scientists who get to help in the discovery, collection, preparation, and curation of dinosaurs in a museum. I look forward to learning more about his work in a few minutes. So let me close by offering my thanks to the Roy Chapman Andrews Society for hosting yet again this excellent event and for inviting me to take part in it. Thank you. Now to provide some historical background on Roy Chapman Andrews and the 100th anniversary of his first Central Asiatic expedition, I'm pleased to invite to the podium our local historian and Andrews biographer, Ms. Ann Bossom. Thank you, Steve. 
It is so wonderful to be together again and how fortunate that we can gather in person this year of all years for the 100th anniversary of the first interdisciplinary expedition that our hometown hero led into the Gobi Desert of Mongolia for the American Museum of Natural History. That 1922 expedition began the same way as the four that followed. On April the 17th, with the departure of the team from their comfortable headquarters in Beijing, using the motor cars that they hoped would safely bring them home again five months later. Andrews had begun laying the groundwork for this trip three years before during an exploratory venture into Mongolia with his wife and fellow explorer, Yvette Borup Andrews. The pair spent months sizing up the land, evaluating transportation options, and building the experience and connections that would support the expeditions that followed. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. The quest for scientific knowledge must almost inevitably accompany the pursuit of another essential commodity, cold, hard cash. And it is, most for, it is the most fortunate of scientists who can inspire the folks who prefer to experience the thrills of discovery vicariously, especially when they have deep pockets. <laughs> Andrews, it turns out, was quite a good fundraiser. He was, in the words of biographer Charles Gallenkamp, witty and affable with a commanding presence and inordinate good looks. These qualities made him popular on the New York Society social circuit, and they opened some very promising doors. One of the first pitches Andrews made was to no lesser a figure than J.P. Morgan, Jr. Andrews, in his autobiography, Under a Lucky Star, describes how he visited the great financier at the Morgan Library. Soon the two were hovering over a map of the Gobi that Andrews had spread out on a table before them. There was always something exciting about a map, Andrews wrote, and this was particularly true in those days when a lot of blank areas were still marked unexplored. The entire central Gobi was a white space with only a few thin lines waving uncertainly across it. I launched into my story with the enthusiasm of a fanatic. In two minutes, everything was forgotten except the prospect of what could be done if only I had the money. <laughs> Andrews captured Morgan's imagination and his pocketbook. He went on to raise the modern equivalent of nearly $4 million for that first expedition. All this so that he could explore an area that appeared as remote and mysterious as, uh, as mysterious at that time as a place like Mars might seem today, or at least as Mars seemed before two prior recipients of this award and their colleagues began to explore it. We'll never know until we try, Andrews had told Morgan. How many scientists have said that? As we know, the conjectures of our hometown hero paid off. The five interdisciplinary expeditions that he led from 1922 to 1930, complete with motorized transport, camel supply caravans, fantastic discoveries, encounters with bandits, setbacks with sandstorms, etc., etc., cemented the reputation of the man whose legacy we honor here today. Let us imagine for a moment the scene 100 years ago as Andrews and his team prepared to leave Beijing. We can almost feel the revving of the engines, see the personnel clambering into cars packed with provisions, hear the cries of excitement as the motor caravan departed. With a cloud of dust following in their wake, the group set off to add fresh lines to the white spaces of that map of the Gobi and made a lasting difference to history and science along the way. Now I'm pleased to turn the program back to Steve Vavris so that we may introduce this year's recipient of the Roy Chapman Andrews Society Distinguished Explorer Award. For the formal introduction of this year's DEA recipient, 
we were hoping to have in-person remarks delivered by Clive Coy, Dr. Curry's close colleague at the University of Alberta. But unfortunately, Clive had to cancel his trip at the last moment. However, in keeping with the virtual world we live in now and needing to be flexible, Clive has put together this special introduction by video to give us his personal perspective on today's featured speaker. I am honored to introduce my friend and mentor, Dr. Philip J. Curry, an internationally renowned paleontologist whose scientific accomplishments have led to our greater, a greater understanding of dinosaurs and their significance. Phil's first dinosaur discovery at the age of six was a toy T-Rex that fell out of a cereal box. Later, while reading All About Dinosaurs by Roy Chapman Andrews, Phil mused if he too could be a dinosaur hunter. As a young man, Phil realized that the very best dinosaurs in the world came from Alberta. However, he would have to go to New York, London, or Berlin to see them. Determined to do something about that, he pursued a university education and in 1976 was hired as Curator of Paleontology at the Provincial Museum of Alberta. Within five years, Phil and his small team had excavated so many fossils that they overwhelmed the museum. It was clear Alberta needed a dinosaur museum and in the early 1980s, Phil was instrumental in establishing the world-famous Royal Tyrrell Museum of Paleontology. In 2005, Phil was ready to take on another challenge as Canada Research Chair in charge of creating the first dinosaur research program at the University of Alberta. Phil's work at the University has included mentoring the next generation of Canadian and international paleontologists producing cutting-edge work on dinosaurian biomechanics and building the highly regarded research facility, DinoLab. In 2015, in honor of his numerous contributions, the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum was opened in northern Alberta. Borrowing from Henry Fairfield Osborne's introduction of Roy Chapman Andrews to a capacity audience at Carnegie Hall, quote, these achievements have not been attained through mere chance or good luck. They are the result of experience, of thorough preparedness, of carefully thought out plans, and above all, energy, enthusiasm, and inspiring leadership of the organizer and commander in chief of the expedition. A man of vision and courage, a man of determination and action, and a man who will not take no for an answer, unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Canada's beloved Dr. Dinosaur, Philip Curry. And with that introduction, with that introduction, I would now like to uh, invite Dr. Curry to come forward to receive this year's award as I read our citation to be followed by his acceptance lecture. Exploration brought you to the distinctive fossils of the Gobi Desert and also to an appreciation for the different people and cultures of Central Asia. As was the case for Andrews in 1932, eight decades later you were awarded the Explorers Club Medal for extraordinary contributions in the field of exploration and scientific research. In addition to a passion for exploring, you both also recognize the importance of professional collaboration as well as the responsibility of sharing your work with the public through museum exhibits, lectures, and in books. In doing so, you advance the discipline while also educating and inspiring the next generation of dinosaur paleontologists. In appreciation for these contributions, we are pleased to bestow on you the honor of Distinguished Explorer from the Roy Chapman Andrews Society this 29th day of April, 2022 in Beloit, Wisconsin, during the centennial year of the awards namesake's first Gobi expedition. <laughs> and 
I will now turn the stage over to Dr. Curry for his acceptance lecture. Well, you can't imagine uh, what a tremendous feeling this is for me. Um, and uh, in terms of awards, uh, it's probably the one that means the most to me, by far. So, thank you very much. Um, I was aware that this was coming uh, months ago, of course, but uh, with all of the problems the world has had, I was definitely worried <laughs> as to whether or not it would happen. It's just not the same thing giving a, a lecture uh, to people online. Um, so, uh, if I uh, blather a little bit or talk too fast, just, just yell at me. <laughs> And if you can't hear me in the back, uh, tell me to speak up a little louder, okay? <laughs> okay, so, uh, it's not a surprise that uh, today I want to talk mostly about uh, our work in Central Asia, because uh, that, of course, has some relevance to Roy Chapman Andrews and to you people here, in a way. It's something you know more about than anything else. But, I uh, thought I'd uh, throw a little introduction in here. Um, the story about the plastic dinosaur is true. And, uh, but I love this cartoon where the dinosaur is fishing in a box of cereal for a little kid. <laughs> I think it says it much more effectively. And uh, it was uh, the age of 11, actually, that I read this book by Roy Chapman Andrews, and uh, I'm not the only person who read it and was influenced the same way by it. Uh, there are other paleontologists uh, who also picked up this book as kids and uh, decided that paleontology was the game for them, but there were a lot more people who didn't end up being dinosaur paleontologists who ended up being scientists nevertheless in other fields because they got a sense of the enthusiasm uh, that can be in exploration, not only in the field, but in the sciences as well. And uh, I think Andrews was just a, a, an absolute master when it came to uh, getting people enthusiastic about things, whether it was to finance expeditions uh, or to take the information from those expeditions and uh, actually um, do something scientifically uh, with displays or with books. Uh, or with television shows, or with lectures, or whatever. And he was a major, major influence on all of my career. This is Velociraptor, uh, one of the most famous dinosaurs they collected in 1923 in the Gobi Desert. And uh, uh, Velociraptor, for a long time, really wasn't all that well known. Uh, people questioned whether, in fact, it was a different animal, or maybe a baby of the, one of the big carnivorous dinosaurs. Uh, but uh, in the last 20 years, we've turned up some pretty remarkable specimens, both in Mongolia and in North America, that show that this animal was a pretty remarkable little guy. And uh, the uh, uh, work of uh, Michael Crichton and Steven Spielberg through Jurassic <laughs> Park, of course, have taken it to two, level, two new levels of fame. And uh, those new levels have made it one of the uh, most popular dinosaurs known anywhere in the world. It is one of the dinosaurs that I actually work on and my students work on, and it's a lot of fun learning more things about this dinosaur. The uh, expeditions, uh, of course, recovered the first protoceratops specimens 100 years ago. And the protoceratops is uh, one of the ceratopsian or horned dinosaurs. It doesn't have horns, uh, but nevertheless it has uh, all of the other characteristics we expect to see in an animal like Triceratops. And uh, this dinosaur uh, helped make the expeditions famous uh, because of the, their importance to North American dinosaurs as well. Uh, but uh, they were the most common dinosaur they collected. And at the Flaming Cliffs has continued to produce Protoceratops specimens with all of the different expeditions that have worked there, I would say that close to 500 specimens have been collected at this point from the Flaming Cliffs alone and from several other sites that we've worked in uh, other parts of Mongolia and China. Uh, so it's a very well-known dinosaur, right from the smallest babies right to the largest adults. And the largest adults can have skulls that are almost two meters long. Uh, so it can be a pretty impressive animal as well. 
and uh, uh, this is uh, the uh, very first specimen that was taken out. Um, pretty amazing uh, accomplishment, I thought. What they really became famous, though, for was eggs. And the assumption was that because so many dinosaur eggs were found at the Flaming Cliffs, and so many protoceratops eggs, uh, or protoceratops skeletons had been found at the Flaming Cliffs, it was most logical to assume that the eggs belonged to protoceratops. And it turned out uh, many years later that that was completely wrong, uh, but uh, we never knew that, and we never understood what the mystery was until uh, about a year ago, uh, when a team of scientists uh, discovered that, in fact, Protoceratops was laying eggs with soft shells, not with hard shells like birds, and that the soft shelled eggs just didn't preserve the same way. And uh, I'm happy to say that one of my students was one of that team as well. These are the eggs, uh, some of the eggs collected by the American Museum back in 1922 to 1925 at the Flaming Cliffs. Uh, you can see there's quite a variety there uh, in terms of both size and uh, shapes and uh, there's no question at all this is not eggs from one type of dinosaur this is eggs from at least four or five types of dinosaurs and uh, that mystery has taken many years to sort out eggs uh, are still relatively rare in the world uh, it's only been in the last uh, 10 to 20 years that uh, we have specialists who do nothing but work on dinosaur eggs. And because of that, uh, we can now sort it out. We only need a little tiny piece of eggshell now to identify what kind of dinosaur it came from. And we have a lot of uh, egg sites around the world, and that includes eggs with embryos inside of them, so that we can actually look at the embryos and identify what kinds of dinosaurs laid them, and be very sure of, of what kinds those are. This is uh, one of the other dinosaurs discovered in, actually in 1923 at the Flaming Cliffs. It's a very peculiar guy called Oviraptor. And the reason it's called Oviraptor is because uh, the first skeleton that was found, and this is the skull on the first one, and it may look a little bit bizarre because it is a bizarre dinosaur. And uh, if the skull had not been found with a skeleton, it would not have been recognized as a carnivorous dinosaur or meat-eating dinosaur. Because the skull is toothless, it has jaws that look like a parrot's jaws or even a turtle's jaws, and it just isn't what you expect to see in a carnivorous meat-eating dinosaur related to Tyrannosaurus rex. So Oviraptor, is a peculiar dinosaur, and it was discovered in 1923. Now, when related forms were discovered in Alberta many, many years later, they were actually misidentified as birds, and they stayed misidentified as birds until better specimens of Oviraptor were discovered in Mongolia, and at that point, uh, we had a better understanding of what was going on in both, on both continents, actually, with these dinosaurs. This is one of the better skulls, uh, may not uh, look a lot better to you, but <laughs> in fact this is a, an absolutely gorgeous skull. It's uh, not Oviraptor, but it's an Oviraptorid, and uh, the, uh, we now know that this is a relatively common type of dinosaur in terms of um, being part of the late Cretaceous fauna, so animals that lived from, say, 65 to about 100 million years ago. And uh, we now believe that uh, they may not uh, be doing quite what we thought they were originally. They may be doing a whole bunch of different things, but they're fascinating dinosaurs. And I'll, I'll actually put a fair bit of emphasis on this. Now, the name Oviraptor means egg thief. And it got that name because the first Oviraptor specimen was found on top of a nest of what they thought were Protoceratops eggs. And those eggs um, were basically broken, so the assumption was that Oviraptor, uh, again, that means egg thief, was eating the eggs, and the eggs were supposed to be Protoceratops. Uh, Protoceratops, of course, is a Ceratopsian, as I mentioned, 
The name, uh, the species name, over after Philoceratops means egg thief who loves ceratopsians. <laughs> and uh, uh, so that's a pretty interesting story, I think, overall, uh, especially the way it turned out. Now, when I uh, went through my education, I, uh, uh, as I explained uh, a little earlier today to a different audience, um, I didn't have much prospect of actually getting a job. But for me, it was important to become a paleontologist and uh, uh, no matter what job you took in the end, uh, you still pursue your passions as far as you can go. And that's what I did, and I ended up moving to Alberta because uh, I never expected to be able to get a job that would take me to Mongolia or China. Of course, back at the time that I went through my schooling, uh, those parts of the world were closed to Westerners, so I definitely never thought I'd get there. So I set my sights on uh, working in Alberta, and uh, many years later, uh, we actually built uh, this museum, the Terrell Museum of Paleontology. And uh, this is something to be very proud about. It's uh, one of the largest dinosaur museums in the world, one of the largest, certainly one of the dinosaur museums, uh, in, the largest in uh, North America as well. And uh, this specializes in uh, looking at dinosaurs from uh, especially Alberta, but other parts of the world too, because people are interested in dinosaurs and so we can um, use that as a way of educating people about dinosaurs themselves. So, uh, the Royal Terrell Museum of Paleontology is in a small town, 7,000 people. It brings in about half a million tourists a year. And uh, it's uh, obviously a huge money generator for that local community. Uh, and it's been very successful. It's changed uh, the minds of a lot of uh, people in not only Canada, but in other parts of the world too, about people's interests in dinosaurs and whether or not they have economic interests. And, uh, um, you know, when I was uh, young, people used to say to me all the time, uh, why do you study dinosaurs? What possible use of that is? Well, for me, it was easy. It was just, I like them. <laughs> But uh, uh, clearly, things like the economic benefits of the Trail Museum, uh, the success of movies like Jurassic Park, the billion dollar toy industry built up around dinosaurs and so on. I mean, dinosaurs are a huge economic generator as well. It's not just dinosaurs, there's all kinds of other um, science things, uh, uh, flying reptiles, uh, you name it. They also generate uh, money in different ways that we don't necessarily see because it's not in our faces. But uh, you take half a million tourists and you put them into a 7,000 uh, population town and then you start being able to measure things. And so it has made a big difference in a lot of ways. Uh, the, uh, one of the funny things about this is that I had an employee who worked for me and uh, when we started to work on the Terrell Museum of Paleontology, uh, we were in Edmonton, uh, which is a city of a million people, so it's a you know, fairly sizable place and uh, lots of cultural benefits and all the rest of it. Uh, and as I said, Drumheller was 7,000 people. He decided that there was no way he could move to a place like Drumheller. And uh, the upshot of it was uh, he left uh, our organization before we actually moved. But before he left, he came to me in my office and he said, um, well, you know, after the Trail Museum's built, what, what do you want to do? And uh, of course, off the cuff, I said, uh, well, I'd like to go to Central Asia. <laughs> I'd like to uh, go to Mongolia and China and to look for dinosaurs in that part of the world. Now, in part, of course, this was an emotional thing. This falls back on my interest uh, having been developed by the stories of Roy Chapman Andrews. But in a big part, it also had a lot to do with the science itself. Because the dinosaurs of Asia are very close, in a lot of ways, to the dinosaurs of North America, and particularly the dinosaurs of Alberta. They're from about the same time period. They represent all of the same families. Uh, we even have, in some cases, the same dinosaurs, uh, both in Mongolia and Alberta. And yet, uh, there's things that we didn't know about Alberta dinosaurs that we could learn from the Mongolian dinosaurs. So, for example, uh, in Alberta, 
we have a preservational bias that works in favor of large dinosaurs. And so in a place like Dinosaur Park, it's relatively easy to find dinosaur skeletons of large dinosaurs. Uh, but the smaller dinosaurs and the smaller animals that live with the dinosaurs are not well preserved. And the reason for that is partly because the environment was very lively. Uh, you had big rivers that were passing through the area and they would tear skeletons apart after the animal had died. Of course, small animals have small bones. They can be picked up by water and washed into different areas very easily and so on. So whether we were talking about baby dinosaurs or small dinosaurs or any of the animals that live with dinosaurs, which included mammals, birds, uh, lizards, crocodiles, snakes, uh, all those things live with those dinosaurs. But we would not find whole skeletons of those animals. So we had bits and pieces of certain dinosaurs that we could say that, uh, yeah, this is a carnivorous dinosaur and we think it's related to Velociraptor but we couldn't look at the whole dinosaur and understand what the whole dinosaur would have looked like as a whole animal. Unless we, in fact, started working in Asia and started collecting the material there where we had whole skeletons of small dinosaurs. It was the opposite effect in, in Central Asia, in fact, so that uh, small dinosaurs were better preserved than the big dinosaurs. And the net result was that um, when we went to Asia in the end, to work in Mongolia and China, we found parts of skeletons that we could identify as the same kinds of dinosaurs in Alberta. We could then come back to Alberta, look through our uh, massive collections of isolated bones, and realize uh, what they belonged to and how they were, were related to each other. And uh, so that was uh, the reason that I wanted to do this and go to uh, Asia. Well, um, the person who uh, did that work and uh, who decided to try and raise funds so that we could go to um, Central Asia, his name was Brian Noble. And Brian uh, uh, separated off from us as, an, as the museum before we opened. And he created something called the Xterra Foundation. And he raised enough funds that we could put together a major expedition into at first we were trying to get into Mongolia, but politically it proved impossible for us to do that. Uh, we had China as a backup, and uh, uh, the Chinese government uh, was pretty favorable towards the Canadian government. Not necessarily that way anymore, but uh, <laughs> at the time it, it worked out very much to our favor. And uh, the Chinese government basically uh, decided that uh, they would help us out and uh, that we could go work in the Gobi Desert of China. Uh, and we put together our first massive expedition uh, in 1986. And uh, actually it only took a couple of months for us to beat through all of the paperwork and uh, get approval to in fact go to China and collect there. Now, uh, Ella Roy Chapman Andrews, uh, uh, one of the things I learned from him is you think big. And uh, that's certainly what happened with the Trail Museum. Uh, I asked for far more than I thought it could ever get. And uh, we ended up with a pretty big museum that brings in all these tourists. It was the same with the Canada China Dinosaur Project. And uh, Brian in the end raised millions of dollars so that we could in fact go to work in China. And uh, uh, the other thing I learned from uh, the Andrews expeditions was that uh, you should be thinking in terms of not just what you're really interested in. I mean, for me, I'm interested in dinosaurs, right? And in fact, you could even specialize in just the meat-eating dinosaurs, and that, that would suit me just fine. But um, knowing what I knew about uh, um, the kind of work that was being done and the kind of work we were moving towards within the field of paleontology. Then I took not only dinosaur people, but we took uh, geologists, we took uh, different kinds of specialists, uh, different types of animals, uh, so fossil turtles, for example, 
uh, people who worked on fossil mammals, people who worked on different uh, things. So this is a little more specialized than the Central Asiatic expeditions in the 1930s, but it's still within the field of paleontology. It's a very diverse group. And so we had experts from uh, China, we had experts from Canada, we had experts from other parts of the world who worked with us as well. And uh, the expeditions were very large. They were also uh, not just all done in Central Asia. Uh, we brought our Chinese colleagues back to Canada and uh, they worked in Dinosaur Provincial Park. Um, it was kind of funny the first time we brought them over uh, we had a pretty luxurious situation in Dinosaur Park where uh, all of the staff had trailers and so on. And uh, as a consequence of that, they, they, they were kind of shaking their head and saying, well, how are you going to come and work with us in China? It's a tough place. <laughs> we don't have those kind of conveniences and so on. So we uh, then took them up to the Arctic. And uh, we worked up in Arctic Canada on Axel Heiberg Island. And uh, it was a bad year. <laughs> it was a year when, in fact, uh, the ice never went out, and so it was cold all the time. The good thing about that, there's no mosquitoes that way. <laughs> uh, but uh, we had up to 18 hours a day of walking uh, to try and find dinosaur bones. At the end of the expedition, we had one fragment we thought might be a dinosaur bone. <laughs> And uh, when we did thin sectioning on that bone and looked at it under a microscope, we realized it wasn't a dinosaur, it was in fact a marine reptile, and we failed 100% on that first expedition. But ironically, it ended up working out okay, because the following year, an Inuit boy found on a different island than the island we were working on, he found dinosaurs. And there were dinosaur bones. So two years later, uh, we went up with the Canada-China Dinosaur Project again, and we actually collected dinosaur material uh, at the highest, most, most northerly point the dinosaurs had ever been collected at that point. So uh, it ended up being a success, but uh, it was a lot of tough work in the meantime. And our Chinese colleagues felt that then maybe Canadians are tough enough to actually work in the Gobi Desert too. <laughs> Okay, uh, the bottom picture is in fact uh, uh, our expedition in 1987. Uh, we had more than 40 people in the expedition and uh, the uh, uh, amount of work we did uh, was pretty amazing. We got some fantastic uh, material. Um, I, oh, there we go. Sorry, whoops, back up a little bit. We collected, uh, amongst other things, this dinosaur. This was a new type of dinosaur called Sangraptor. It's a beautiful animal. And um, just one of the many beautiful skeletons we got from uh, northwestern China. And uh, uh, it uh, certainly turned the expedition into a success. It wasn't quite what I wanted, though, because this was a Jurassic dinosaur. And for dinosaurs, to compare the dinosaurs of North America and Asia, which is what I really wanted to do, we needed to look at the late Cretaceous beds, so much younger beds. So at the end of the expedition, though, we did a uh, long trek across China. And at that time, there were no roads in the Gobi Desert. So we did 6,000 kilometers uh, across northern China looking at dinosaur sites in the north of the country, and eventually we came to this one. And uh, the moment we came to this one, I knew we had found exactly what I was looking for. This was misidentified on the geological maps as a, um, a site from the age of mammals, not from the age of dinosaurs. Uh, but it looked so much like the flaming cliffs, uh, it was no surprise that when we started looking around, we started finding protoceratops skulls. And uh, it was uh, quite remarkable, as far as I was concerned. Now, a little bit of research uh, showed us that uh, this was a little bit different than not only uh, we thought at first, but the Chinese had thought as well. It turned out that we had come in from the west, from northwestern China. And most expeditions had found these exposures by coming in from the east. And it turned out that 
Andrews and the Central Asiatic Expeditions had been there in 1928. And we found this uh, picture, uh, let's see if I can get it from this side, here, in one of the notebooks of one of the geologists on those expeditions. Uh, the Sino-Swedish expedition had been there in 1930. Now, this picture doesn't look very exceptional, but I'll tell you this was on January 2nd, and it was minus 40 <laughs> when it was taken. And uh, then below that, uh, the very uh, grainy looking picture, this is from a Russian expedition in 1959. And this is what that area looks like today. So it's still recognizable as exactly the same spot. It's a place called Ulan Sanchi. This is at the east end of those exposures I showed you in the last picture. And it turns out that uh, Ulan Sanchi doesn't have that many fossils. And unfortunately, between the east end and the west end is an awful lot of sand dunes. And uh, so the net result was that because it was tough to move across those dune areas, and they didn't find much bone anyway, they didn't go any further. We had come in from the west, and we'd hit the heart of the exposures where all the dinosaurs were found. And so we had a, a absolutely amazing site, which is still an amazing site, still producing lots of dinosaur bones. Uh, this is one of the uh, sites that we found there. Uh, this is a place at uh, Bayan Mandahu where a dinosaur, another dinosaur that was found by the Central Asiatic expeditions back in the 1920s uh, had been recovered from the Flaming Cliffs. It's an animal called Panacosaurus. It's one of the armored dinosaurs. Well, we found uh, in one site 12 babies. And uh, these babies were, well, not young babies, they were probably about three years old. But these guys had all died together, and they probably died in a sandstorm. And the uh, painting you see in the uh, bottom corner there is uh, uh, depicting what we think may have happened. We think the sandstorm started, uh, they hid behind a dune, the sand kept coming over the top of the dune, and it buried them. And they buried them deep enough that they couldn't dig their way out, and uh, they ended up dying together. So we ended up with 12 of them together. Uh, of those 12, six of them were in fact uh, side by side and parallel to each other, which is exactly what you expect to see in a windstorm. And uh, so uh, one of the major uh, finds that we had at Bayan Mandahu, but a very good uh, site for us in a lot of ways. Uh, dinosaur eggs. Uh, we found the same kind of eggs that were found uh, certainly at the Flaming Cliffs. Um, the uh, uh, nests themselves were very interesting. If you look at that nest, uh, you can see there's a tendency for the eggs to be in pairs. And the fact that they're paired like that tells us that uh, the mother dinosaur was in fact laying the eggs two at a time. And uh, that's very interesting in, in its own right. Now, um, wow, I, I must have a heavy hand or something. Um, on the last year that we worked there, in 1990, we found this site. And it doesn't look like much. Uh, you know, if, if, if uh, you're in the ground and you look at the eggshell and, and the bone, you can clearly identify it. But this is the way it would looked when we found it. And basically, these are eggs that have been cut into sections by erosion. It's in the side of a cliff face. And you can see there's bones lying on top of the eggs. And uh, uh, we realized that those were oviraptor bones, egg thief bones, and uh, that those were the so-called protoceratops eggs again. Now, what are the chances of uh, a dinosaur raiding a nest to get food and getting caught in a sandstorm and saying, no, I'm not going to leave, I'm going to stay until the sandstorm's over um, and eat all these eggs. Uh, once, maybe, twice, that didn't seem very likely. So our uh, initial thought was that, uh, okay, these are probably oviraptor bones lying on top of a nest of oviraptor eggs. 
because the maternal instinct is an awful lot stronger in all animals than the instinct to just feed your face. And uh, so our thought was that uh, uh, we had uh, maybe shown something that hadn't been found in the Central Asiatic expeditions and that uh, we were going to get different results. Here's a reconstruction of uh, what happens uh, uh, when we worked on that nest of eggs and the skeleton on top. Uh, we figured that uh, in all probability this was a mother dinosaur laying the eggs when she died. She was in, in essence laying two eggs, turning her body a little ways, laying two more eggs, turning her body a little ways, laying two more eggs. So she was standing on one spot and she produced a circle of eggs around her feet and then put a second layer on top. And as she was uh, uh, laying the eggs, she was using her hands to scoop sand up onto the eggs so that they were buried. And basically she produced an egg mound uh, of, uh, in this case, only one layer of eggs. And that told us that she was in the process of laying the eggs, not that she'd finished yet. Uh, we knew from other nests in the Gobi Desert that, in fact, uh, they could lay up to three layers of eggs uh, in these egg mounds. So that was pretty cool. And uh, around that time, the American Museum had gone back to Mongolia and started working in Mongolia, and they found this specimen. Um, and uh, it more or less tells the same kind of story. Uh, this is uh, an oviraptorid, again, not oviraptor, but a different one. And uh, uh, this area right here, these are eggs. These are pairs of eggs. And they go in a circle around the feet of the dinosaur. As you can see the arms are stretched out on the side of the nest. And uh, the skull, unfortunately, ah. <laughs> the skull had eroded off. Um, but uh, the chest of the dinosaur was lying on that circle of eggs. The tail of that dinosaur was lying on the circle of eggs. And uh, the hands were on the outside of the circle of eggs. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, somebody uh, uh, put this all together. This is around the time that we actually found feathered dinosaurs for the first time. And we realized that the feathered dinosaurs had these long feathers behind the arms. And that if you put the feathers on the arms, they cover up the eggs that were not covered up otherwise. And they came up with the theory that the reason dinosaurs started developing long feathers was not for flying, because of course you can't start flying until you have very long feathers, but that the feathers may have developed initially as a way of protecting the eggs that otherwise wouldn't have been covered by the chest or the tail of that dinosaur. So um, we got another step in this. Now in the early 1990s, uh, we switched from working in uh, China to working in Mongolia. And we've gone through many series of expeditions there. Uh, we're planning on going back again this year. We haven't gone in the last two years, but basically uh, we still work in uh, beds of late Cretaceous age in the Gobi Desert. And uh, we've learned an awful lot. We've collected a, some pretty amazing stuff over the years. We've gone back to the Flaming Cliffs many times. Uh, uh, you've probably seen a picture like this in recent years uh, because other people have gone back and um, tried to photograph or re-photograph the sites that have been found by the Andrews expeditions in the 1920s and uh, been able to uh, look at the amount of, er of erosion that has taken place in those beds. So this is the, uh, the two towers in the center of the Flaming Cliffs. And basically, I think one of the calculations they came up with is that about five meters of sediment have eroded away over the years, uh, in, in the last 100 years, which is pretty remarkable. Most of that erosion is taking place because of the wind. The wind uh, is pretty amazing there. <laughs> You've probably heard from uh, various stories of Andrews and others. Um, but because it's constantly eroding like this, there's always new fossils coming out. And uh, so you can go to the Flaming Cliffs and you can still find protoceratops skeletons and skulls, you can find Phanacosaurus, you can uh, be nice if we could find more Velociraptor. It's not very common, I'm afraid, but uh, it's one of the dinosaurs you still can find bones of. 
Um, <clears throat> this is, of course, the famous picture of the first dinosaur nest. It was found on the lip of a cliff, and uh, you can see the, uh, the Dodge truck or Dodge vehicle down below there. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, uh, the main cliffs, the two towers, is in the background. Um, and uh, uh, the other picture in the upper corner is, in fact, uh, what it looks like now. Uh, the interesting thing was that uh, uh, we could stand on the spot where uh, Shackleford took the photograph originally, and we could take the same photographs more or less. But uh, when we looked down, we had found, in fact, another nest of dinosaur eggs. And so we found a nest almost in the same place that the Andrews Expeditions had found a nest of protoceratops, or so-called protoceratops at the time, but which we now were suspecting was, in fact, um, not protoceratops eggs, but they were oviraptor eggs. Ah. Okay, and there's protoceratops. Uh, didn't, we've talked a lot about them, but uh, I didn't show any pictures. Nice skull of uh, protoceratops. And uh, literally, you can find uh, sometimes as many as half a dozen skulls a day. That's how common they are there. Okay, uh, much of my work has in fact uh, been further west in Mongolia, and these are uh, beds from uh, the same age, as it turns out, as the Flaming Cliffs, but they represent a different kind of environment, whereas the Flaming Cliffs and Bayan Mandahu down in China represent desert environments, or very arid environments. Uh, when we move a little bit further west, we start finding these beds that are a lot more like the beds we find in Alberta. And the dinosaurs that we find in those beds are a lot more like Alberta as well. And uh, uh, yet, the funny thing was, one of the things that we found in 2007 was another site like the one I mentioned in China already. There were bones sticking out of the hillside, the cliff, and underneath were eggs. And sure enough, we excavated that site, and uh, it turned out that we had yet another nest with the mother dinosaur sitting on the nest of eggs. And this turned out to be a different kind of oviraptor id. Okay, so a relative of oviraptor, but it was called Nemegtmaya because it comes from a different formation. And uh, so that was pretty cool. So we had another nest. And uh, so uh, since the original nest of the Central Asiatic Expeditions was found with the oviraptor on top, uh, we have found two more nests with mother dinosaurs lying on top, and the American Museum of Natural History has found two, uh, three more nests with the mother still lying on top. So it's a pretty common behavior uh, for these mother theropod dinosaurs to take, take care of their nests and uh, probably brood those eggs until they hatched. Uh, I should also mention that in China now, uh, over after it's have been found with the eggs still in the body, uh, confirming that they were laying two eggs at once. Uh, and uh, um, what we know about over after it's overall, which used to be very rare dinosaurs, um, it's now become one of the most, or one of the best understood biologically uh, dinosaurs. Okay, so we know more about the biology of these dinosaurs than probably any others, and that's because of all these sites that we find in, um, in China and Mongolia in particular. Uh, this is a shot taken in our last expedition. Uh, it was 2018, before COVID, and uh, uh, this is a pretty uh, cool site, a shot taken from a drone, and uh, um, in that middle of that circle of people there, uh, we found nine skeletons of an oviraptorid. And uh, it's probably a new type of oviraptorid, a new species of oviraptorid. Uh, it's not, not a very big one, it's about half the size of oviraptor itself, uh, but a very cool sight and um, uh, just amazing what you can find in the Gobi Desert. Okay, I wanted to switch for a few minutes and just talk about uh, some of my favorite dinosaurs. Uh, <laughs> I do a lot of work on Tyrannosaurus, and uh, Tarbosaurus is a Tyrannosaurid, 
that is the same family as Tyrannosaurus rex, or as Albertosaurus, or as Gorgosaurus, dinosaurs that I work on in North America. But Tarbosaurus uh, is much more common in the Gobi Desert than Tyrannosaurus are over here. Uh, this dinosaur is now known from more than 100 skeletons. And uh, the list that you see there of the numbers of dinosaurs that we find uh, shows the picture. Tarbosaurus is more common than any other dinosaur, and that doesn't make any sense at all. You can't have more carnivores than herbivores. <laughs> carnivores normally make up something like 5 to 10 percent of a population, period. And if you have more than that, they're going to overeat, and then all the plant eaters will be gone, then the meat eaters die, because of course they don't have food. It doesn't uh, make any sense. So something's going on in the Gobi Desert at these sites that is preferentially preserving Tarbosaurus. And um, it's uh, a hard one to figure out. Uh, here's a couple of the skeletons. I'm just going to go back for a sec to the last slide. Um, <clears throat> on the left side of that picture, uh, or maybe it's the right side, I'm, back, I'm looking at the thing backwards right now. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you can see an outline drawing of a uh, Tarbosaurus skull that we collected. And the skull is disarticulated, that is, the bones have fallen apart in the skull. But half of those bones are pushed about half a meter into the mud, about a foot and a half into the mud. And uh, uh, it didn't make any sense when we found the skull and we started excavating it, until at the, uh, about a meter away we found these things. These are footprints. Footprints had never been reported before from this site in Mongolia. And there it was. There was no question about it. These were duck-billed dinosaur footprints. And the reason that skull had been disarticulated and pushed into the mud is because one of the duck-billed dinosaurs had actually stepped on the skull and pushed it into the mud. It got revenge. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it wasn't a very big pterosaurus, but uh, still no question. Now this was amazing. And uh, this was like a light switch going on. Uh, we suddenly realized that this area had footprints. Nobody had ever reported footprints, even though all of the major expeditions that had worked in Mongolia had gone to this site. Nobody had seen footprints. On our way down to camp, because we were only about 200 meters from camp at the time, uh, on the way down to camp, the light switch, as I said, had been turned on. We found about four or five sites where there was dinosaur footprints. And uh, it's crazy to think that as professionals, we had worked there for years and never seen dinosaur footprints. But these footprints were well preserved. They were beautiful. And uh, uh, as we uh, looked around the area a little bit more, we realized that uh, this is just a, an artist reconstruction and what it shows you is one of the duck-billed dinosaur footprints on top of the Tarbosaurus um, skull and the reflection of the mother dinosaur <laughs> in the water. I, I think it's a really cool picture. So I had to throw it in. But uh, as we looked around, we realized that footprints were unbelievably common at this site. And uh, uh, let me just show you. You can see this layer here. All of those bulges that you see on the lower side of that layer, those are footprints. We were finding footprint layers that went for uh, up to a couple of kilometers, uh, maybe a couple of miles, and uh, the footprints were uh, separated by uh, a meter or a yard each. And as I said, nobody had ever seen these before. Now, when we started looking at those, the footprints were amazing because they were so well preserved that many of them actually had skin impressions on the bottom. Um, we could identify what kind of dinosaurs they belonged to, uh, including Tarbosaurus. But we could also look, uh, have this snapshot of what was going on in that area about 70 million years ago because footprints, of course, are made by living animals. And when you find uh, that the majority of your footprints are from duck-billed dinosaurs, 
and that Tarbosaurus is only about 5% of the footprints, then you realize that um, this layer is giving you a much more accurate idea of what was going on in the paleo ecosystem at the time. And so uh, this helped prove that uh, Tarbosaurus wasn't all that common, that Tarbosaurus um, was just overrepresented for some reason. We still haven't figured out what that reason is. We have some ideas, uh, but we're working on it, and we keep working on it year after year. There's a, uh, a footprint from Tarbosaurus, and there's a Tarbosaurus uh, bony uh, foot uh, showing you the, uh, the three toes. Uh, some of these footprints, uh, like that one actually, uh, actually shows the skull, or not skull, the uh, claw impressions in the mud even. Um, so they're, they're quite beautiful. We have uh, actually trackways as well where these animals were step, stepping in succession. So you could look at the, how long of a stride there was uh, between uh, different uh, footprints, the right and left. Uh, the last little story I'll tell you about is, is another mystery from a later expedition. And uh, the Polish-Mongolian expeditions worked in Mongolia uh, from 1965 to 1971. And uh, they found uh, a dinosaur that was only represented by the arms. And unlike Tyrannosaurus rex or Tarbosaurus, it didn't have short arms, it had very, very long arms. And they didn't make any sense. These arms are almost two meters in length. There's the arms. There's some kids to give you an idea of scale. This is where the site was found. And uh, we've always had a lot of respect for the Polish-Mongolian expeditions. I uh, can't quite see this, but these are the arms. So since 1965, we puzzled over what kind of dinosaur this was. Uh, couldn't have been an animal like Tyrannosaurus or Tarbosaurus because the arms were just too big. Uh, but there are many things that uh, uh, really uh, are mysteries in the dinosaur world. There's types of dinosaurs we haven't discovered yet. Uh, so maybe it was a new type or maybe it was an ostrich mimic dinosaur, an ornithomimid, uh, which had relatively long arms. Or maybe it was a, um, a Therizinosaur, which is another weird dinosaur from that part of the world that's very poorly known. So we had these arguments for a long time, and we never solved them. Now, one day what happened, though, is uh, we found a partial skeleton. And the skeleton had been poached. That is, uh, we had people, bandits, our own type of bandits these days, and they'd gone in and they'd hacked up a skeleton. It was a large skeleton. Uh, when uh, we first saw it, I thought it was another Tarbosaurus. We actually uh, took information on it and then went away from it. And uh, the more I thought about it, though, the more I thought, you know, that wasn't Tarbosaurus. <laughs> and we went back later in the day and looked at it again, and I realized this is a type of dinosaur we don't have represented uh, at this stage. And so we decided that even though <clears throat> the poachers had stolen the skull and the hands and the feet from the specimen, that the rest of the skeleton was still scientifically valuable and would tell us something about a type of dinosaur we just didn't know about. And so we collected the rest of the skeleton. <clears throat> and uh, uh, at that point, we still had a couple of ideas as to what kind of dinosaur it might be. But uh, we came up with the idea that it probably was Dinochirus, those long arms, because we found part of an arm, and the arm was very elongate, and it seemed to indicate that it was the same kind of dinosaur. Now, we collected that specimen, uh, the whole body essentially, and it was a big dinosaur. Um, and uh, around that time, a colleague in Europe gave us a call and said, uh, I, know you're very interested in uh, Dinochirus, but in uh, one of the dealer's uh, warehouses in uh, Germany, I think it was at the time, uh, we've got this really weird dinosaur skull. Uh, we're pretty sure it's from Mongolia, and it's got claws with it as well, uh, from feet and hands. And uh, maybe you should come over and take a look at it. We think it might be Dinochirus. <laughs> 
And so we went over to see our colleague who was in Belgium, and uh, we found this skull. Uh, it's a weird skull. I mean, it looks almost like a uh, duckbill dinosaur skull. It's got a big duckbill on it, for example. But there are things about it that told us it's not a duckbill dinosaur. This is, in fact, um, a ostrich mimic dinosaur. And uh, we also had the claws from the feet and the hands, as I said. Uh, we had several fresh breaks in those uh, bones from the hand and the feet, and they actually fit onto the bones that we had collected oh. the skeleton of. And we could snap the thing back together. Um, so we actually uh, did some horse trading, and we got the skull back. The skull went back to uh, Mongolia, along with the skeleton that we had collected, and for the first time we had a pretty good idea what Dinochirus looks like. And this is a very, very strange animal uh, with a duck bill. Uh, it's got uh, very long arms, like an ostrich mimic dinosaur, more or less what you'd expect to see. It's got uh, long uh, spines on the backbone, like a Spinosaurus. Um, it, the end of the tail actually was all fused together. We're pretty sure it has uh, what, what's called uh, piga style, uh, the Pope's nose from a turkey, for example. Um, and we're pretty sure that uh, this animal had feathers there. It had stomach contents. We could see that the animal was eating um, swallowing stones to help it digest plant food, but also that uh, it had fish vertebrae and scales in its stomach, so it was obviously picking up fish and eating fish as well. It's an omnivore, which is more or less what we thought uh, was happening with um, Ornithomimans Enkwe. And this is the reconstruction of that dinosaur, a uh, beautiful painting by Michael Skrebnik, and uh, the paper that appeared in Nature on this dinosaur. So we finally solved that mystery. And there are a lot of mysteries like that uh, that still need to be solved. A lot of them go back to Roy Chubb and Andrews. <clears throat> I'm eternally grateful for the influence he had on me. Um, he got me into something that uh, uh, I've always loved. And uh, as much as possible, I've tried to emulate his interest in the science. I I'm probably consider myself more of a paleontologist who does research on dinosaurs, and that's my main thing. But uh, I also feel that public education is important, education of our kids is important, and uh, these are things that uh, we'll never turn our backs on as well. So uh, Andrews uh, um, was my big influence. <laughs> and with that, um, we're going to finish, and I'm going to ask you if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Professor Curry, for that informative lecture. There were all sorts of things in there that were new to me, at least, and probably to others, too. The story about the footprints, the feathers, and the double egg laying. That's bizarre. So thanks for giving us those specific examples. And we, Dr. Curry is happy to take a few questions. However, there is a catch. Uh, we were unable to get our roving microphones for today. And so we have a couple of options for questions. We welcome people to come up to the microphone up front uh, to just come up here and, and ask a question. It'll definitely be loud enough then. The other option, if you have a voluminous voice and want to uh, express your question from where you're sitting, that's fine, and Dr. Curry could just repeat it because we are live streaming, we want everybody to hear it. So uh, please take a few minutes to uh, ask a question and we'll, we'll proceed from there. I'm willing to take a shot. <laughs> Given plate tectonics and uh, where Gobi is and uh, where Alberta is, where were they in relation to each other 65 to 100 million years ago? Uh, are, are there things that explain some of the connections? Uh, the connection actually was up through Alaska and Siberia. And 
It's one reason we find Arctic dinosaurs in, in both uh, Asia and North America. And uh, we're doing as much exploration as we can in, in those areas because we think we're going to find uh, our direct connections of where the dinosaurs were going. I mean, basically, uh, back in the late Cretaceous, uh, the continents were more or less in the same positions they are now. North America was, in fact, about five degrees further north than it is today, so uh, we're talking about high-latitude dinosaurs for these things. The dinosaurs would move into the Arctic, in my opinion, uh, during the summer months when you have very high plant productivity and the food source is very good and there's lots of it but uh, they couldn't stay there in the winter because in the winter you've got 24 hours of darkness it wasn't necessarily that cold but uh, that basically forced these dinosaurs into big herds that would move south and uh, believe it or not, the southern limit of their migration every year was probably Alberta. That's probably one of the reasons we have so many dinosaurs in that part of the world. And uh, that uh, they would stay there for the winter months and then move north again in the spring uh, to work, you know, again, collect, get their food in the Arctic uh, situation. Now the thing is that when you're in the Arctic, and there are land connections there. If you move a little bit to the right, you're gonna end up in Asia. If you move a little bit to the left, you're gonna end up in North America. And I think that's the reason that uh, our dinosaurs and the Asian dinosaurs are so closely related to each other. And why, when we uh, find a type of dinosaur that's new to one area, it's only a couple of years later that we find that it was also in the other area too. And we started looking for things like that. And we found some unbelievable, uh, strange dinosaurs in, in recent years in both Asia and North America. And, uh, um, of course, they're related to each other. <laughs> Uh, hi. Um, are there any kind of holy grail fossils out there that you love to find, like complete versions of incomplete skeletons, or transitional specimens, or hypothesis confirming things? Like, are there, what's the holy grail you'd love to find? The uh, holy grail for me would be a troodon skeleton. <laughs> troodon is a dinosaur that was described on the basis of one tooth from Montana in 1854. <laughs> One tooth, and that tooth is so diagnostic that the name still exists today. Uh, we found partial skeletons in Montana and Alberta of the animal. We have a pretty good idea what the whole animal now looks like from all these bits and pieces, but we don't have a whole skeleton. And uh, Troodon is such a cool dinosaur. This is a dinosaur with a brain six times larger than you would expect to find in a dinosaur. Um, so if you take, uh, um, you know, a, a hundred kilogram uh, troodon and compare it with a hundred kilogram alligator, uh, troodon would have a brain six times bigger than that alligator. It's an animal with enormous eyes and the eyes face forward like our eyes. It's got binocular vision. Its hands have manipulative powers. It's got an opposable thumb. Its feet are elongated. It's like an ostrich mimic dinosaur. So we know all these things, but we have no single skeleton from Canada or the States or anywhere in North America to tell us exactly what that dinosaur looks like. That's my holy grail. I really want to find one of those. <laughs> I have more of a request than a question. Can you just keep speaking for a couple more hours? <laughs> Is that a no? <laughs> well, you know, for me, I love talking about dinosaurs. <laughs> well, I'll do a follow-up then. Um, you talked so admiringly about your work with other paleontologists. Is it generally a very cooperative practice together, or is there competition? Just be interesting to hear how the scientists work together, or if money issues come into it. Yeah, it's, it's like any field that uh, uh, the majority of people, I think, get along very well with each other and we're very cooperative. And so if I find a particular type of dinosaur and it's not the kind of dinosaur that uh, I specialize in, I'll always call up a colleague 
who works on those kinds of dinosaurs and then offer them the, uh, the right or the time or the ability to, in fact, work on those dinosaurs. And, and people do that to me all the time as well. And so I would say that it's a, it's a very good field overall, but every now and then you get a bad egg who uh, gets jealous about things. And um, you've probably heard of the Cope Marsh Wars in the 1870s. And uh, the, that was two paleontologists and uh, uh, they were independently wealthy of each other. One uh, worked mostly for Yale University, the other one worked mostly for, I guess, the Academy of Natural Sciences originally, but the collection eventually ended up at the American Museum of Natural History. But the, uh, the Colt Marsh Wars really got nasty. I mean, to the point where uh, at the end of the field season, uh, they would actually take dynamite and dynamite their quarry so that the other person couldn't come in and take anything out of it. It kind of backfired once because they found that uh, they collected part of a new type of dinosaur and uh, uh, they'd blown up the rest of it, so <laughs> uh, they basically had to send uh, a crew back in to try and put all the pieces back together and get the rest of the skeleton. <laughs> so uh, that happens too. Uh, but I'm very happy to say that normally it does not happen, and that normally uh, the relationships between paleontologists um, in the same field or in different countries even uh, is very, very cooperative, and uh, it's a great field to be in. Okay. Uh, Jeff, you're going to talk about I'm intrigued by the grouping of uh, the dozen or so very young dinosaurs. And since you very clearly showed us the nests, and now we've got a cluster of three-year-olds, do we know anything about the early lives of very young dinosaurs? Well, we're learning more all the time, and that's because of sites like this. Uh, we're finding out that, in fact, dinosaurs probably did take care of their young, at least certainly by the Cretaceous period they were doing that. That uh, uh, the mother probably even brought food to the baby dinosaurs, so that the dinosaurs didn't even have to leave the nest uh, for a period of time. But uh, like modern animals, of course, you get a whole range of different behaviors. And so although some dinosaurs may have done that, uh, as it turned out, the ankylosaurs or armored dinosaurs, the uh, duckbill dinosaurs were certainly doing the same kind of thing. A lot of them were. Some of the carnivorous dinosaurs even appear to have been uh, taking care of their young. But there's other dinosaurs where the evidence probably points the opposite way, that the young were left to fend for themselves and survive. So, a little bit of everything there. And uh, the more we can learn about it, the happier we all are. I mean, one of our goals in paleontology now is not just to name another new dinosaur. Our goal is to find out what we can about the biology of these animals. Why were they so successful for 150 million years? Hello there. Hello. Um, <laughs> uh, so I recently watched a video on uh, Tyrannosaurus, uh, sort of like the little arms, right? Yeah. Um, and you briefly talked about Tyrannosaurus rex, and the point of the video was sort of uh, talking about the fact that Tyrannosaurus rex, their little arms weren't actually pointed out towards the front, they're like... Yeah, well, chicken. I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, well, that's true. You can take your arms and you can put them backwards like this, you can lean forward like this. Um, I think that uh, the whole idea, and a lot of other ideas that are out there about Tyrannosaurus rex arms, I mean, show just what kind of a fascination we have with how can an animal that's so big have such little arms? <laughs> uh, but uh, when you work on those dinosaurs, you also realize that those little arms have claws this long. <laughs> There's something else going on in there. Uh, the scapula on the animal, the shoulder blade, is big. It's really big, and it's got very powerful muscle scars on it. So those little arms actually had big muscles backing them up. Uh, when you look at the uh, upper arm bone, the humerus, it's very, very thick. It's very short, but it's very thick and very wide. And uh, I believe, my theory, <laughs> I believe that uh, the reason that Tyrannosaurus rex and most of these big carnivores have short arms is not because they were 
useless, not because they were scratching the site <laughs> where they had a problem and so on. My belief is that they were small like that because they didn't need big arms anymore. Their skulls are enormous. The skulls are a meter and a half, uh, five feet long. And the teeth are gigantic. I mean, we, we've got teeth that uh, the crown of the tooth, the exposed part, is six inches long. And, uh, you know, people often talk about Tyrannosaurus rex teeth being like uh, steak knives. They're not like steak knives. They're like big bananas with uh, serrations of steak knives on the front and the back. Uh, they're teeth that are meant for crushing bones. Uh, this is a very nasty animal in a lot of ways. Um, but the problem is when you have such a massive skull with such massive um, batteries of teeth you've got a lot of weight up there and uh, the bigger you get disproportionately your weight is redistributed so you have a lot more weight in the front and less weight in the back and Tyrannosaurus and the other Tyrannosaurus were finding ways to reduce the weight and unbelievable things they ended up doing I think one of them is shortening the arms but another thing is that they uh, actually took uh, tubes from the lungs and the throat and put those tubes into the bones in the front half of the body so that the bones became pneumatic, air-filled, and they're lightly built. Some of the pneumatic bones in the skull are only about a millimeter thick, and the rest of the bone is like a big balloon. Um, it's an animal that was doing everything it could to lighten the front part of its body so it didn't have to have a counterbalance in the tail where it increased the weight even more. Um, so uh, it's a very uh, sophisticated dinosaur in so many ways. When you look at Tyrannosaurus rex, it's, it's an awesome dinosaur. Uh, it was doing all kinds of things, but those little short arms are part of it. Um, they were still being used for something, that's evident from the muscles and it's evident from the claws. Uh, but uh, exactly what they were doing with those arms, I don't know, but the main thing is uh, it wasn't using the arms to capture its prey, it was using its jaws to do all the nasty work. So I really enjoy eggs, I'm a very egg person. Um, <laughs> The eggs you showed were in very neat pairs. Is there any way you could tell if they were connected at all? Or like as they were in the mother's womb, they were connected so that when they came out, they would stay in those neat pairs? No, they, uh, they actually would fall apart. So they were laid two at a time. Well, we have a mother uh, from southern China, which is actually in the process of laying eggs. So the two eggs are side by side. But they're coming from two separate oviducts. So they couldn't have been connected to each other uh, physically in any way. They were just laid side by side. And in most cases, we can't see that. Uh, these oviraptor nests are pretty amazing because they were laying them two at a time. They, they weren't dropping them from any great distance or anything like that. So they, they mostly stayed together in these pairs. But, uh, but even there, we can see that they fall apart from each other as well. <laughs> but a great question. <laughs> uh, what kind of classes did you take in college? Well, I went through biology, <laughs> and uh, the tendency these, day, these days is uh, most dinosaur paleontologists or most vertebrate paleontologists tend to be biologists more than geologists, whereas previously it was the other way around. But the reality is you need a little bit of both. And so I took a lot of biology and some geology, and I also had to take uh, the math, chemistry, physics stuff as well that you need to get for the prerequisites so you can move to the more interesting subjects. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's, it's uh, pretty amazing what's available now because there are universities that specialize in paleontology as well. University of Alberta is actually one of them. And I'm very proud to say that uh, we've rated in the last five years as one of the top three universities in the world for vertebrate paleontology courses. And so we have a lot of courses in paleontology uh, in both the geology department and the biology department. Uh, and so you can almost focus on paleontology uh, courses more than anything.
Thank you for all those great questions. And for all of you who would also like to listen to Dr. Curry for two more hours, we've got the answer for you. <laughs> Purchase a book up front, Dinosaurs 101, which are his course notes distilled into a book. I've read it cover to cover, and I can tell you it's super informative, and not only that, but it's written in a way that's accessible to a huge range of ages. So if you're an adult, you'll enjoy it. If you're a middle schooler, high schooler, precocious elementary student, uh, <laughs> seriously, you, you can get something out of this. And there's even colorful dinosaurs on the cover. So uh, great as a gift, great as a purchase for yourself. Uh, he, Dr. Curry will be giving signed copies up front as you're leaving the library, and he'll be around to do that for the next several minutes. So on your way out, please do that. And for those of you who are signed up for the dinner tonight at Beloit Club, you can head over, and the rest of us will make it uh, after that. And so thank you again for attending today, and thanks once more to Dr. Curry for your time and expertise.